Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless first timothy 4 1 now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons first timothy 4 16 pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching persevere in these things for as you do this you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Well, five current members of Congress are ordained ministers, three in the House, two in the Senate. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock is one of them. He goes back to Atlanta every Sunday to preach at his historic church. Matt Galco traveled to Georgia to talk to the pastor and senator about how his faith influences his politics. It's Easter Sunday at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. These same pews bore witness to sermons by Martin Luther King Jr. as he led the civil rights movement. Still to fight on. The church is close to politics once again, as the senior pastor of Ebenezer is also Georgia's junior senator. We will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. From the pulpit to the plow fields of rural Georgia, Raphael Warnock is attempting to balance his first full term in the Senate. Someone might ask, why would a preacher get involved in something as messy as politics? I'm a patriot. I love America. Only in America is my story possible. You're looking at a kid who grew up in public housing. I serve in the United States Senate. I'm a Matthew 25 Christian. Uh, you know, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. When you feed the hungry, when you clothe those who are naked, when you visit those who are sick and in prison. And so that's the work that I've tried to do as a pastor. Warnock says his faith drives him when advocating for things like racial justice, reducing gun violence. As a pastor, I'm, I'm praying for those who are affected by this tragedy, but I hasten to say that thoughts and prayers are not enough. Warnock and Oklahoma Republican Senator James Lankford are the Senate's only two ordained ministers. While scriptures they both read are from the same book, the partisan divides remain on a variety of topics, none more evident than the issue of abortion. Lankford is outspokenly pro-life, while Warnock labels himself as a pro-choice pastor. You have not been shy about saying you're a pro-choice pastor. The horror of abortion is precisely an attack on the least of these, the unborn baby, is weak and defenseless and are the most vulnerable members of the human family. It's in the 25th chapter of Matthew that Christ foretells how he will come again in glory to judge all the nations and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep at his right hand but the goats at the left. Christ says to those who are on his right who feed the hungry Give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, visit the sick, and go to the prisoner, that as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me, ushering them in to eternal life. Those who are on the left, who are unsympathetic to the least of these, are instead told, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It's not enough to believe that Jesus is who he says he is if our actions don't match our words. Jesus proclaims this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, to some Christians out there at least, they're probably sitting at home and saying, well, this guy's not a real Christian then. I mean, my, my faith is so basic to who I am. Um, I, 
I don't f feel a need to uh, defend uh, my Christian identity. I'm a man of faith. I love the Lord with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. Raphael Warnock participates in a pride parade on Sunday, October 9th, 2022. Reverend Warnock is a proud ally of the LGBTQ plus community. The evil we are seeing today isn't Republican versus Democrat, right versus left. It's good versus evil. There are only two groups of people in this world, the saved and the unsaved. Here's a question everyone needs to answer. Whether you are a Democrat, Republican, or not affiliated with either party, do you love Jesus? Many professing Christians say they love Jesus, but in all actuality, they hate him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Many who profess to be Christ followers are pro-abortion, pro-homosexual, and pro-transgender. They are defiant to the laws of God, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. How then can these people claim they love Jesus when he said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus declares, They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, as we read in Matthew 15, 8 and 9. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For those who say Jesus never said anything about abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism being a sin, the Bible tells us all scripture is inspired by God as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture has plenty of negative things to say about killing the innocent and homosexuality. It's called lawlessness. Many professing Christians justify sin by using Christ's commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself means telling them the truth in love, not by condoning their sin. The good news is, God will forgive all sin, as we read in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And um, Christians have a whole range of differences on a whole range of issues. And um, for me, the acid test of your faith is the depth of your commitment to the most marginalized members of the human family. Do you find it hard as a pastor to find a biblical defense for being pro-choice? Oh, my, my stance as a pro-choice pastor is not in spite of my Christian identity, it's because of my Christian identity. Uh, I believe in human agency and I believe in choice. Notice how he didn't give one verse of scripture as a biblical defense. Look, um, I, I have a deep reference, reverence for life, profound reverence for life. Uh, and I have a respect for choice. If a member of your congregation came up to you and said, well, pastor, senator, I like you a lot. I like what you have to say. But Psalm 139, 16, I knew you before you were born. I just, I just can't get with you on that pro-choice, pro-life debate. The question is, whose choice is it? And I, I still believe that a patient's room is too small and cramped a space for a woman, her doctor, and the United States government. And I think um, as we're seeing this debate play out right now, um, there is diversity on that point, even inside of the evangelical Christian community. Colossians 2.8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Matthew 24.11, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. False prophet is the Greek word pseudo which means a pretended foreteller 
or religious imposter. A false prophet is a person who spreads false teachings or messages while claiming to speak the word of God. Rather than speak the word of the Lord, false prophets deliver messages that originate in their own hearts as we read in Jeremiah 23, 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. In the New Testament, Jesus warns his followers about false prophets as we read in Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The Bible goes on to tell us that these false teachers are Satan's servants, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The last day's church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. This is what last day's Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says, Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex, and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3.14-22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and I salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, 
and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God! What if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.